much for your patience. It took us a little while to get on, but we are here. So <laughs> welcome to the Aquarium Online Academy this Friday morning. If you take a look behind me, you'll figure out what we're looking at. What are we looking at? Well, I see water and I see land. We must be talking about wetlands. That's right. So this episode of Aquarium Online Academy is all about wetlands. Now, my name is Stacy. I'm coming to you from the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. And my friends uh, James and Jen are here to help us out with our class today. So let's get going. So we noticed that this is land. Ooh, right there, land. That's wet. That's a wetland. Now, wetlands can really be different. You're basically just looking for an area of land that is wet for some part of the year. It doesn't even have to be all year long. And the level of water can change as well. Now, here in Southern California, we tend to see a lot of wetlands that are close to the coast. So sometimes they're even connected to the ocean. They get fresh water from the land and salt water from the ocean, they mix together and they create something called brackish water. Brackish water just means that it's not super salty like the ocean, but it's not super fresh like a river or stream. It's kind of somewhere right there in the middle. And those areas here in Southern California are often called estuaries. So that's kind of the special wetland name. Now let's take a quick look here. What else do we see besides just land and water? What do you notice? Now, if you want to share what you notice, we encourage you to participate by text. In fact, there's our number. It's 562-286-1838. So you can text in your observations. You can also text in any questions that you might have. Now, if you're not watching this live on Friday morning, you can also email us questions. And that email address is live at lbaop.org. All right, so that's right up there on the screen for you. What do you notice besides just land and water? Well, one thing I notice is actually on the land. There's lots of plants, right? So there's a lot of plants that you could find in a wetland. Do you think there's any other life in a wetland? Well, in fact, there is. A wetland is so productive. That means there's so much nutrients, so much food, and a lot of really great shelter too, that you get a lot of life in a place like this. Now, some of that life will hang out on the land, some of it will hang out in the water, and some will kind of go in both. So let's take a look at some of the wildlife you might find in a wetland. What do you notice? Well, I definitely noticed some birds. Now we do have these birds flying overhead. So over the wetland, kind of up in the air, of course, that's how you, where you fly. Um, but what about down in the wetland itself? Do you see any birds down there? Yeah, definitely. And you know what's interesting too about this video here is take a look at the land. That is not really easy to walk on solid land, right? What does that look like to you? Well, to me, it kind of looks muddy. And I bet you, if we tried to walk in that mud, your shoes would stick. In fact, sometimes wetland mud is so sticky that if you were to put your foot in it and pull your foot up like you're gonna walk, your shoe would just stay in the mud and then you lost your shoes. So that's how sticky and thick that mud is. So just imagine being an animal like this and having to walk on that mud. How does that work? Why doesn't this animal just sink in? Well, what are some other things we notice about this animal besides not sinking in the mud? What are some things that you notice about its body? Now, when we're really taking a look at a plant or an animal, a living thing's um, bodies, you might notice stuff that's going to help it survive. Characteristics, things like big teeth or big eyes or being really fast. Those are some different things that are going to help animals survive. Those things are called adaptations. Can you say that with me? Adaptation. So adaptation, stuff that's going to help these animals and the plants survive in their habitat. So what are some adaptations you notice about these birds? Things that are going to help them live in a wetland where there's water, plants, 
Sticky, sticky, sticky mud. Hmm. What do we notice? Well, while you're making those observations, we have a couple of texts coming in. So thanks so much. Um, we have Mrs. Mikulik's class asking, is this wetland near us? And that's a really great question. I'm actually not positive exactly where this one here is from, but our wetlands look really similar. Even if this one is not here in Southern California uh, near LA and Long Beach, our wetlands look really similar because did you notice not only do we have the mud, the water, and the plants, but take a look back there. There's lots of people back there, right? And uh, our wetlands, we have quite a few wetlands that that's kind of the same thing. Our, we have people that live really, really close to the wetlands. So you're going to see homes and things like that. Um, so it's possible, but I'm not 100% sure. Good question. We have uh, Ms. Navarro's class asking, oh, oh. They noticed, we think there's life, excellent. There's definitely life. And there's life that we can't even see in this video here that we'll explore a little bit later. Definitely seeing birds. I love these observations. We have Zoe asking, do we have baby turtles? And how would they survive with birds? Oh, so baby turtles. Um, now, typically, you don't find too many baby turtles in the wetlands, at least around here. Most of the baby turtles are going to be um, near the coast when they first hatch, right? But those coastlines tend to be the sandy beaches. And that's because that's where mama turtles will lay their eggs. Now, once those baby turtles hatch, they go out into the ocean and they just kind of stay out in the ocean because that's the best place for them to hide. It's the best place for them to find food. It's also a really, really great place to just kind of hang out is out there in the ocean. Their adaptations, their bodies are really made for the water. So most of the baby turtles you're actually gonna find um, actually out in the ocean or on a sandy coast if they just hatch. So great question. Uh, and then we have St. Martha's asking, oh, saying, we see birds. Excellent job. Um, wondering what other kinds of critters. That's a really good question. What other kinds of animals do you think would live here in a wetland? All right, well, I bet you there's animals that live in the water. What types of animals do you think would live in water? I bet you, too, there's animals that live in the mud. Hmm. And, you know, we have land, so why not have animals living on land, too? In fact, the wetlands around us, we have uh, coyotes, bobcats, lots of different kinds of birds, even ones that don't live in the, uh, in the water or near the water. So, uh, great, great question. All right, so we were talking about these birds. I hope you made some observations. What are things that you noticed? Well, I noticed those very, very long legs. Take a look at those legs. Those legs are really helpful, right? If you were to have to live in this wetland, by the way, I just found out this is an East Coast wetland. So not really near us, but similar. There's a lot of things that are similar. And that's, we kind of know this because of the birds that we see there. So there we go. These long legs are great for walking around in shallow water, right? This means that those feathers that are so important for them for flying and for staying warm don't get wet and muddy. So great thing to have those long, long legs. But wait a minute. I also noticed these birds have really long beaks, right? Why would they have such long beaks? Hmm. Well, did you have a chance to see how they eat? A lot of birds with these very long beaks will actually stick their beak in the mud to find the animals that live in mud. So we said that there are animals that live in there, but what kind of animal would live in mud? Do you think it'd be a really big animal? Probably not. It'd be hard to dig into that sticky mud and live in there, right? So it must be some things that are small. In fact, we have little crabs, snails, clams, worms, lots of things that kind of almost look like bugs. And you can see here, Let's see, let's get rid of our text line number so we can really take a look at that beak and how it works. There we go. Thanks, James. All right, so take a look at that. They stick their beak in the sand or in the mud and they're able to get the little critters that live right there on the surface to eat. Pretty cool. Great adaptation. 
Okay. Now, uh, oh, here's a good question. Now that we have seen this bird, why don't we go underwater and take a look at what kinds of fish you might see underwater? Because Grandview is asking us, what, what fish do you see in there? Now, here is a view of the exhibit that we have here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. We call it our shorebird exhibit because we have a lot of wetland birds and we have some wetland fish as well. So what do you notice in this picture? Lots of silvery fish, right? So lots and lots of silvery fish. We have things like perch. There are these funny fish called mullets that will sometimes even jump out of the water here in uh, Southern California. We will even have fish that are good at hiding. Did you see any fish hiding in the sand? These silver fish swimming by make it hard to see them. But take a look right here. Did you notice those eyeballs? Look, one there, one there. There's a fish hiding in the sand. This is a flatfish. So you definitely will have flatfish that hide um, in the mud and in the sand really hard to find. So there's lots of different kinds of fish that will be in a wetland. Now, some of those fish don't even live there all the time. Some of those fish just stop by to hang out or to have babies. And then those babies will grow up. They'll get a little bit bigger and then they'll head out into the ocean. Because here in Southern California, those estuary wetlands, remember they're connected to the ocean. So some of those ocean fish stop in they lay their eggs, those babies hatch, they have a place to grow that's more shallow. There's a lot of things like seagrasses and other kinds of plants and algae there that can hide these baby fish. And then when, once the baby fish gets a little bit bigger and can survive a little bit better, maybe there aren't as many predators or animals for that, uh, to eat them, they'll head out into the ocean to get even bigger. And eventually they'll come back to a wetland too to lay their eggs. So lots and lots of different kinds of fish. Excellent, Grandview. Thank you for that question. We have Mrs. Guzman's class asking, what is the largest animal that lives in the wetlands? Ooh, that is a really great question. I think it probably depends on which wetland you're talking about. Um, I think locally, probably the biggest animals we have in wetlands are, are probably like bobcats um, and coyotes and people. People kind of hang out in wetlands. But there are some wetlands like swampy wetlands where you're going to find things like alligators or uh, panthers, even big snakes. So there's lots of different kinds of animals that you can find in a wetland. I think they tend to hang out, the big ones at least, tend to hang out on land. But sometimes you'll even get, uh, you'll even get some uh, like things like rays and, and smaller size sharks like three foot sharks or four foot sharks that go into wetlands too. Now, speaking of animals that you might find <laughs> um, on land, we actually have an animal visitor for you all to see. So, stand by. Yes. So I wanna introduce you to my friend Amanda. My friend Amanda here actually has a fun, uh, a fun friend with her. This animal here is called a blue tongue skink. Now, do you think this animal is made for water? We're looking at adaptations, right? We're gonna look at its body. Does it have things that are gonna help it survive in water? Um, well, Amanda's showing us that cute little foot there. Those feet aren't great for water swimming, right? So this is a land animal. In fact, this animal really likes land a lot. <laughs> now, how do you think it got its name Blue Tongue Skink? What color do you think its tongue is? If you said blue, you're absolutely right. Now, uh, our Blue Tongue Skink friend here doesn't need to stick its tongue out right now. They do stick their tongue out to eat, which is very important, but they also stick their tongue out to kind of sense their surroundings. And right now, he's so comfortable, he doesn't really need to do that. So he's just kind of chilling, hanging out, taking a look at the screen or at the uh, camera here so that way all of you can get a really good look at him. What are some things that you notice about him? He's quite long, isn't he? He's like almost the length of Amanda's arm. Wow, and that tail, what a great tail. <laughs> now they're actually pretty, pretty strong. 
uh, they're, they're pretty beefy. <laughs> and they're not the lightest animals because of that. Another thing that's really fun about them that I, I love is the shape of their face. Take a look at this little guy's snoot or snout. <laughs> it kind of is a triangle shape. To me, it looks a lot like a shovel. And they'll even use their noses to kind of dig around a little bit too. So now um, you may have noticed every so often he looks a little bit see-through. That's because he's so shiny that it's actually reflecting some of the green screen that we have behind him. So I know that may look a little bit funny, but that's kind of, uh, <laughs> that's what's going on there in case you were wondering. Now question, is it a reptile or an amphibian? That's a really good question. What are some of the differences between reptiles and amphibians that you know of? Well, um, it's hard to know for, you know, whether it came from a jelly egg or from a hard shelled egg because he's definitely not in egg form right now. <laughs> but he came from a hard shelled egg. So this here is a reptile. Another thing too, um, I'm not sure how easy it is to see but it definitely is covered in scales. So blue tongue skinks are reptiles. Uh, question, is it poisonous? As far as I know, it is not poisonous. No poison, no venom, anything like that. The blue tongue that they have, besides just being super cool and blue, um, is actually a really good thing to scare away predators because it doesn't have poison or venom, but a lot of things that have poison or venom um, are brightly colored, right? So if an animal sees this bright blue tongue, by the way, often when, uh, when the blue tongue skink is using that tongue for defense, it's also hissing. So if you're hearing hissing and you see this giant tongue flashing about and it's blue, it's kind of crazy, right? And so if you are a predator, you might go, whoa, what is that? And get spooked and maybe run away. And that's a really great way for this animal here to stay safe. Um, Oh, excellent. We have a, a, an observation. It has skinny legs. Is that an adaptation? It seems like a funny adaptation to have, right? To have these tiny, tiny little legs. Well, it actually works really well for this animal here because it does tend to hang out on the, on the earth. So it's on the ground walking around. Um, it doesn't need to prop itself itself up very far because of the habitat that it lives in. So in a way, it is an adaptation. All right. Now I'm going to ask uh, Amanda here if there's anything she wanted to share about a blue tongue skink that I haven't quite said yet. Excellent. So Amanda just, uh, we had a question asking how long do they live? And they live into their late teens. Um, and then another thing that Amanda wanted to share with you all is what it eats. What do you think an animal like this would eat? Well, it's hard to know because we can't see inside his mouth. But this is an omnivore. Do you know what an omnivore is? I like to call them omnomnomivores because they eat a lot of different things. An omnivore eats both meat and plants. The meat that this little dude eats is, tends to be insects, um, and I think we give him mealworms, crickets, things like that. And then they also eat plants, so veggies and fruits. So in a lot of ways, we kind of eat similar things, except I don't typically eat too many insects. But we're omnivores. Sometimes we choose to be vegetarians, or sometimes we choose to be meat eaters. <laughs> But excellent. What a great guest. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you, our fun blue tongue skink friend. <laughs> All right. So that was really good. I love that we had a chance to practice our observation skills and you were able to find so many cool adaptations. So when you look for those adaptations, for when you look at an animal and try to really understand its different parts and why they have those parts, you can actually figure out a lot about a critter without even having to know it right off the bat, which is super duper cool. All right, so shall we head back to the wetlands? I think we probably should. So a wetland habitat is a really interesting habitat. Oh, look at that. Excellent. We can see that flatfish very, very well there. So the flatfish, ooh, what is a good adaptation of a flatfish? What do you think? 
I think its body shape is great, right? It's like a carpet. It just lays on the sand. And laying on the sand like that's good when you don't want to be seen. What else is uh, an adaptation of the flatfish? That flatfish is, is the one that's right here. Look at that one right there. I think a great adaptation is its ability to bury itself. Yeah, so the way they bury themselves, they're flat, right? So just think about like, like a carpet, a small carpet. And then when they get on the sand, they floof up the sides of them. They just kind of go woof, 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 woof. And then it poofs the sand, and then the sand lands on them. And then they're covered in sand. So that's a great way to hide yourself in sand, to bury yourself. They don't have hands. They can't dig. They don't have paws like a dog, so they can't dig. They don't have the face of the skink, so they can't dig there either. So the floofy body um, <laughs> is what helps them to get that sand on them. The other thing that's really great, if you noticed in the back one there, is its body color actually matches the surroundings too. So the body color matches the sand color. Do you know what that's called when they can blend in really well with their environment? Camouflage. That's right. <laughs> they have camouflage. Awesome. Okay, so we have a couple more texts coming in here, so I want to make sure that I have a chance to um, at least say some of them. We have uh, Mrs. Deguchi's class noticing the long legs on the bird. Excellent job. We have uh, Ms. Gutierrez's class asking how many species live in wetlands. Ooh boy, you stumped me. I have no idea how many species live in wetlands. If we just take a look here in this video, I think we have four or five different species that swim by. But just imagine if this was a wetland actually out there, um, a, a, like a real wetland, not just a wetland here at the aquarium, like say this one here, there's a ton of mud. There's a ton of space, so much plant life. So you're going to find a lot of little things all over the place, even bugs. This is a great place for bugs. So I'm gonna probably say hundreds of species depending on how big the wetland is and where it is, maybe even more than that. Maybe even we're talking like thousand. I don't know. But I would say hundreds is probably a good guess. And then we have Mrs. Barraza's class asking, how can these birds walk on mud? Great question. Shall we take a look at those birds? So we see it walking on mud pretty easily, right? We're saying that it's sticky. Well, their little toes are skinny and they're kind of spread out. You see that right there? There's the little toes. So those little skinny toes that are spread out with a tiny bit of webbing, so that means there's a little bit of skin between their toes too. That's actually gonna help them stay on the surface of the mud. Another thing that's really helpful is that these birds uh, have hollow bones, so they're very light. And being light's gonna be helpful because when they step down on the mud, there's not as much weight making them sink into the mud. Now there are some other wetland birds that have toes that look a little bit different than this. In fact, there is a wetland bird, um, like a duck here, that has completely webbed feet. So the whole foot has skin between all of the toes. And in a way, uh, when they step down, it spreads out the weight of that duck. Instead of being like just skinny toes, it spreads the weight out into big, flat surfaces, which helps them so they don't sink as much. Um, if you've ever seen snowshoes, I know that's kind of a funny, uh, a funny reference, but I've seen them like on cartoons and on TV shows and stuff. Um, a snowshoe is basically a, a really big space. And so when our little foot stands on this really big space, it spreads out our weight so we don't sink into snow. It's uh, their feet kind of act very similarly. Now we are very close to out of time, so I'm gonna uh, kind of finish up these last, uh, I think one last question. We have uh, Ms. Polito's uh, class asking, uh, can these animals camouflage all their lives? Well, it depends on the animal. For that flatfish, absolutely. It's an entire life it can camouflage. But take a look at the, oh, that duck there. <laughs> I'm going to see if, if James can pull that up again. Take a look at this duck. 
Now it has some pretty good camouflage colors, right? This brown rust color will probably match the brown that it lives in and the, the dark head and light cheeks that might match like shadows and light. But wait a minute, that beak, that's not very good for camouflage. In fact, we were talking about the blue tongue skink having that blue tongue that really stands out. Well, this blue beak also really stands out. And that's because right now for this duck, for this picture, it was breeding season. That means he's trying to attract the lady ducks. And in order to do that, he has to have a really bright, flashy beak that says, hey, lady ducks, I look pretty good. And I'm also really healthy because I have a bright blue, healthy beak and so many beautiful, floofy feathers. So this is one way for, um, for this animal called a ruddy duck to show off how beautiful it can be. So the girl ruddy ducks will like him. So not all animals are gonna stay camouflaged their whole lives. It really just depends on which animal, but that's a fantastic question. Now I do wanna ask um, our teacher friends out there, we are actually done with our class here. Teachers, if you have your class joining us today, if you can please text us how many students were, um, were attending, that is really helpful for us to just get a good idea of how many folks were watching this session of our Aquarium Online Academy. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Again, if you have more questions, we do encourage you to send us that email. Uh, so our email address again is live at lbaop.org. Thanks so much. Bye from Long Beach.